Hey, what's up guys? A few months ago I released this video about a physics simulator I created, and a few months after that I released another video about that same physics engine being used in a project called Engine Simulator. A lot of people have asked for some more technical information about how Engine Simulator works, so that's what I'll be talking about today. If you guys want to see some wacky engine designs, Engine Simulator actually made it to Motor Trend. Check out the article they wrote about me and the exclusive video I made for them, the link to that is in the description. I'm working on an improved and much more usable version of Engine Simulator, and if you want to support that project and get a copy of it when it releases, check out my Patreon. Anyway, the main challenge of Engine Simulator was implementing a fluid simulation that was fast enough to run in real time, but accurate enough to produce realistic audio and realistic torque and horsepower numbers for a variety of engines. The first step is to simplify the complex system of air pathways in an engine into discrete volumes. I did that by assuming that I could take a large fluid system, break it down into individual discrete components or vessels, and each of these vessels has its own pressure, volume, molecule count, and temperature, and it can also be connected to other vessels with valves. You may recall this equation from high school chemistry, PV equals NRT, which relates all of these measurable quantities. I despise this equation, not necessarily because it's wrong or inelegant, I just couldn't never understand what it was trying to tell me. If you're not familiar with this equation, it states that pressure multiplied by volume is equal to the number of molecules in that system multiplied by a constant times temperature. So I monkeyed my way through the physics trying to get something to work, but as it turns out, tracking pressure, volume, and temperature is really inconvenient and it's an unintuitive way of doing things. It was at that point that I decided to investigate how PV equals NRT is derived and what it really means. This led me to the kinetic theory of gases, and this more fundamental description of gases made a lot more sense and it was a lot more convenient when dealing with gases flowing from one vessel to another. The theory is very simple. It states that gases can be modeled as minuscule particles that move around and collide with things. According to this theory, temperature is just a measurement of the average speed of these particles. Pressure is the amount of force that these particles impart on the walls of the container, which of course also scales with the average speed of those particles. So we can actually collapse pressure and temperature into a single value, which is the sum of the kinetic energies of all the gas particles in the system. This visualization uses the fluid simulation code from Engine Simulator. Keep in mind that the particles that you see on the screen are just a visualization, and this is not actually a particle-based simulation. If you're interested in how I implemented this graphical effect, I might discuss it in a future video, but it's pretty simple. If we increase the average speed of the individual particles, the total kinetic energy of the system will also increase. And as you can see, both the temperature and the pressure of the system also increase. If we remove kinetic energy from the system, the particles move more slowly, which decreases both pressure and temperature. Changes in volume are also very easy to account for using this theory. Since we know that the gas exerts a pressure that tries to oppose compression, when we do compress the gas, we must be putting work in to do this. And due to conservation of energy, that energy has to go somewhere, and it actually ends up increasing the kinetic energy of the gas particles, which of course increases pressure and temperature. Conversely, if you decompress a gas, the gas must be doing work on the piston, so kinetic energy must be leaving the gas particles, which decreases pressure and temperature. This approach is especially convenient when you want to account for flow from one vessel to another through a valve. By the way, a lot of the math that I used when implementing Engine Simulator is from Internal Combustion Engine Fundamentals, uh, which is a really great book and I highly recommend reading it if you want to gain deep knowledge about engines. Anyway, according to that book, the flow rate through a valve can be calculated using this equation. We're not going to talk too much about this equation, but the important thing to take from this is that given the pressure on either side of the valve and a flow constant which describes the flow rate of that valve, we can calculate the mass flow rate of air. Molecules have a constant mass, so with this mass flow rate, we can actually calculate the number of molecules that should be transferred from one vessel to another per unit of time through that valve. In this example, the gas will want to move from a high pressure vessel to a low pressure vessel until they both equalize. 
Accounting for this transfer is as simple as calculating the mass flow rate and then subtracting from the molecule count in the source vessel and adding to the molecule count in the sink vessel. Each of the molecules that left the source vessel will take some kinetic energy with them and that will reduce the kinetic energy of that system and also add kinetic energy to the sink system where they all end up. And with just this simple arithmetic, we have a basic fluid simulation that conserves energy and gives reasonably realistic results. Let me show you some examples of what you can do with a simulation like this. So this example here is a simple piston pump similar to what you might find in an air compressor. Air is drawn in through this inlet, which opens up to the atmosphere through this check valve. A check valve is just a valve that allows airflow in one direction only. As you can see on this pressure gauge, when the piston rises, it pulls a partial vacuum in the cylinder, which draws in ambient air from the atmosphere. When the piston descends, it compresses that air, which raises the pressure and forces it through this outlet and then through another check valve into the air tank. One thing that I haven't talked about yet is bulk velocity. So the kinetic energy of all particles, which produces temperature and pressure, comes from random particle motions in no particular direction. Bulk velocity is an average velocity that is directional. So wind, for example, is a bulk movement of air, and it's independent of temperature. You can see that when air is drawn into the vessel, the air gathers momentum in that direction. This effect is very important when you're modeling an engine because it plays a role in both the ram effect and exhaust scavenging. So the ram effect is when you take advantage of air velocity to force more air into a system than should be possible. So this is one of the reasons why small port intake runners can be good for performance on engines by forcing the air to travel more quickly, and that will increase the ram effect. In this demo, we have a small vessel with low pressure connected to a long tube with a valve at the end to allow ambient air in. When the valve is opened, the air rushes in very quickly and the air in the tube gathers momentum. So keep in mind that atmospheric pressure is about 14.7 psi. The moving air actually increases the apparent pressure at the check valve, which forces the vessel above atmospheric pressure, almost like a supercharging effect. Some people were wondering how naturally aspirated engines can achieve volumetric efficiencies above 100%, and this is one way in which it theoretically can be done. Scavenging is a similar effect, but on the exhaust side of the cylinder. So in this demo, we have a highly pressurized tank with 300 psi air connected to a long tube that vents to atmospheric pressure of 14.7 psi, which approximates a cylinder right before the exhaust valve is opened. When this valve is opened, air rushes into the tube and gathers momentum just like in the previous example. So at first, the tube pressurizes, but notice how the pulse of moving air leaves a low pressure zone behind it. This low pressure pulls more gas from the tank, leaving it below atmospheric pressure when the valve is closed, which is kind of counterintuitive. Exhaust scavenging is one of the biggest reasons to use headers, and they are specifically designed to take advantage of this effect. We can also use this simulation to simulate refrigeration. So the goal of most refrigeration systems is to use ambient air to cool a refrigerant, usually to very low temperatures. The problem with this is that ambient air is pretty warm, so it's not very useful when you want to cool something below that temperature. A fridge, for example, needs to keep its insides a lot cooler than room temperature, which is usually around 20 to 25 degrees. The trick is to first compress the refrigerant. So as you can see, this causes it to heat up and it's now hot enough that it can begin transferring heat to the ambient air, which will usually be cooler. So in this demo, after the air is compressed, it runs through a radiator which brings the refrigerant closer to atmospheric temperature, which is around 25 degrees, as I mentioned before. You can see that there is a large temperature differential across the radiator now. So after the compressed refrigerant is cooled to around room temperature, it goes through a restrictive nozzle, which separates the system into a high pressure side and a low pressure side. The low pressure on the other side of the nozzle causes the refrigerant to expand rapidly, which cools it down. This cold refrigerant can then start absorbing heat from the air inside the refrigerator. So this is not exactly how uh, real refrigerators work, but the principle is the same. If we stop the pump, you can see that the refrigerant will quickly return to room temperature. 
All the code for this fluid simulation is available for free on my GitHub in the Engine Simulator code base. The link to that is in the description. It's very simple and I'm currently working on improving it, but it works okay, all things considered. So with this system, building an engine is as simple as defining vessels for the main components, like the intake plenum, intake runners, combustion chamber, headers, etc. And the connections between those components, uh, like openings and poppet valves, can also be defined in a similar way. The mechanical components of the engine are taken care of by the rigid body simulator, uh, which I explained in another video. I wasn't able to find a lot of information about converting airflow to audio, but I made some educated guesses. So firstly, we can directly sample the fluctuating air pressure in the exhaust system and turn that into an audio signal. This is more or less exactly what I did in Engine Simulator. I added very basic processing based on some heuristics that I came up with. So the first assumption is that the sound signal propagation through the exhaust system can be modeled using an impulse response and a convolution filter. I talk more about convolution in uh, my video about Bloom if you're interested, but it's fairly simple and it's a common technique used in signal processing. If you've done some work with audio, you're probably already familiar with this technique, but I'll show you a simple example. Let's say I record this completely random audio clip in an anechoic chamber. Hi there! If you feel the need to leave a comment complaining about my use of imperial units, please stop it! Get some help! I don't actually have an anechoic chamber, so this is recorded in my closet, but you get the idea. Let's say I wanted this audio to sound like it was actually recorded in a different room. So what I would do is first record an impulse response of that room to capture the audio propagation characteristics of that space. This impulse response is basically the sound that you would hear if a perfect impulse travels through that room, which is why it's called an impulse response. I don't have an impulse generator, but you can approximate an impulse using a clap. So this is the impulse response I got from my living room. And here is the impulse response from my fake anechoic chamber. And you can see how they both sound very different. What I can do now is perform a convolution of my original audio with the impulse response of my living room. And it now sounds like I played that sound in that room, which is kind of interesting. Hi there! If you feel the need to leave a comment complaining about my use of Imperial units, please stop it! Get some help! This is exactly how Engine Simulator works, except instead of rooms, we want the impulse responses of exhaust systems, and the input sound signal is the pressure wave that we simulated earlier with the fluid simulation. Probably the least scientific element I added was some random noise to account for turbulence. I don't really know how theoretically correct this is, but I think it would make sense for turbulence to create a random signal, which might explain why flowing air tends to make a hissing noise, uh, which sounds a lot like white noise. So to recreate this, I simply modulated the signal with some noise and I added a little bit of jitter. And that's pretty much all the processing that is done to the signal. A lot of people seem to think that most of the audio generation actually came from this audio filtering step, which is definitely not the case. Our ears are very sensitive devices, and they're a lot more sensitive than our eyes. Um, so just because a signal looks like it's very simple or looks like it's a sine wave, it doesn't mean that that is actually true. To prove my point and put everything together, let's work our way up from the most simplistic possible engine sound simulator all the way to what engine simulator currently does. So the first approach is the complete bonehead style of just playing the same sound every time a combustion event happens and basically just playing the same sound very quickly, depending on the engine RPM. So I'm not even going to bother simulating engine rotation speed, I'm just going to vary it directly with the keyboard. We can make it sound a little better by taking header length into account, um, and this changes the timing that the exhaust pulses reach our ear, um, and the sound level of those pulses. Mm, look like 
that garbage. It's getting better, but the way the engine changes RPM really doesn't sound right, and I think that's actually a major cue uh, when we assess the realism of an engine sound. If we simulate the motion of the engine using the fluid simulation that I mentioned earlier, so actually simulate the individual combustion events and the air coming into the, into the intake and that kind of thing, but still maintain the simplistic audio generation, uh, this is what it sounds like. And, and you can see that the RPM fluctuates randomly, just like in real life, which adds a little bit more realism. This sounds a lot more acceptable, but there's still no engine braking effect, which sounds very strange, and it overall just doesn't sound very good. If we use the output of just the fluid simulation, we can get quite a lot closer to a good engine sound. So keep in mind, this is with absolutely no audio processing whatsoever, which supposedly was what was responsible for most of the audio according to these Reddit experts. We can now reintroduce the EQ filtering just to make the sound a bit less muffled. And remember, this is still completely procedural. Um, I haven't done any kind of trickery or used any samples or anything for this. This is just what's coming out of the fluid simulation. final step, we can re-add that convolution filter that I mentioned before, just to get that sound kind of where we want it. And you can obviously tweak this a little bit, but it really doesn't make that much of a difference depending on how you've put your engine together. Um, and we, I can also add like a little bit of noise to account for turbulence like I mentioned before. And now we have basically the current state of engine simulator. This is what the audio output sounds like. <laughs> Sure that some people are still going to say that this is not a real simulation or that it's not as good as the tools that automotive companies use or whatever. I don't know what a real simulation is to those people, to be honest. Is BeamNG a real simulation? Is Flight Simulator a quote-unquote real simulation? What does something need to be in order to qualify as a simulator? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sure that the sophisticated tools that car companies use are great, but they don't really solve the same problem that I set out to solve with this program. Taking an entire night to simulate one combustion event is cool and everything, but it's pretty useless for real-time applications, and that's what I was going for here. So I did what I could to maintain the realism, but still make it performant enough to run on consumer hardware. Anyway, the code is publicly available, as I stated before, and I've explained all of the important techniques that I used uh, in this video, so you can be the judge of whether this software is legit or not. There is obviously a lot more to the code than what I've talked about, but I've covered the most important things. The rest is kind of mundane stuff that I didn't think was useful to talk about. Some people did ask about the graphics, so everything was made with my own game engine, and I designed all of the gauges and UI components from scratch, so I didn't use a library for that because I had a very specific idea of what I wanted this to look like. I'm sure at least one person watching this video is an expert on fluid dynamics or combustion engine design, and they're probably going to find something sacrilegious that I've done. And that's great. Please share your knowledge in the comments or join my Discord server and message me there. I never claim to be an expert or anything. Um, and I never claimed that this tool was revolutionary. I, I don't know why people assume that, that I was saying that. It just uses knowledge that has been known to engineers for decades now, and it tries to adapt that to a real-time application. 
Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.